This is Twit. Hey folks, I'm Ant Pruitt. And what do you get your favorite tech geek that has everything? A Club Twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With the Club Twit subscription, they get access to all of our podcasts ad free. They also get access to our members only discord, access to exclusive outtakes behind the scenes and special content such as AMAs, which I just love hosting, plus exclusive shows such as hands on Mac, hands on Windows and the untitled Linux show. Purchase your geeks gift at twit.tv slash club twit and it will thank you every day. So, Catherine, I know you had from our back channel, <laughs> you had a question queued up. I watched a talk that you gave a while back about trust and the process of Linux kernel development and, and the processes you go for, go through. And I think probably most people listening have some vague idea of the process and that your patches um, are still come over email, which I thought was interesting. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why email is still the best option for the Linux kernel. Um, and and I and actually I you know I wondered if you could speak a little bit about this idea of trust and why the process is trustworthy because obviously it is I mean it's everywhere but but the, I I found um, the conversation around that pretty interesting. Sure, I'll talk about. Um, I get a lot of flack for this, but email actually is the lowest <laughs> common denominator that everybody in the world has access to. It's that simple. Um, it's also really really good when English is not your native language, and we want to have people with. English is not their native language contributing. And as someone who lives in another country, it's, take, it's good to read a language, text in another language, process it, take the time to do it back. I know some open source projects want IRC, face-to-face -face meetings and whatnot. And that puts that at a huge disadvantage for people that aren't don't know English really, really well. So great, English, our email, lowest common denominator, works everywhere, works for everyone, um, works remotely, um, store and forward, works Everywhere else, we have one of our core security people lives in somewhere in the middle of Africa. I don't really know where. I think he moved countries and he was doing store and forward and it worked really great and nobody really realized where he was. Um, it works great. And also plain text, HTML or no HTML, email works great. It also provides a really good way to prove who you are. You can sign. We sign our patches and you can see any patch that I send out. It's cryptographically authenticated. I can verify that it comes from you. Um, we've actually had some cases where people spoof what company they're working for, and we've caught that because it's like, oh, look, no, you obviously are not coming from so and so.com because your email says it's not coming from that, uh, that. So it's easy to detect that, things like that. And then usually that's the, oh, our IT department doesn't work. We had to use Gmail, which is almost always the case. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all, the, all the Linux companies usually have a Linux box in the corner that so they can go around the Exchange server. Even Microsoft, who's a big contributor to Linux, has a Linux box in the corner, so it doesn't hit the Exchange server and they can send their patches out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it, it, email it works out really well. Um, the trust issue is interesting. Um, I have a friend who um, contributed to the kernel a while back, and he was like, he said uh, it was terrifying the first time he contributed to the kernel because all of a sudden, the work that he's putting out there is going to be viewed by the world with his name on it, right? And that's a good thing because you do really good work when your name is on something. You can't hide anonymously behind something. And you do better work because it's out there for everybody to see. And it's fine if you do things wrong, you get things buggy and whatnot. I mean, I joke, I've probably written more bugs than anybody else. Um, and that's, that's true. So um, as long as you acknowledge your mistakes and learn from it and go forward, and that's great but you're out there in the world contributing with your name. As far as trust goes, I mean, we had the problem where the University of Minnesota tried to submit some patches anonymously and claimed that they were sending false or buggy, known buggy patches to us. And they wrote a paper up and said that we accepted them. It turns out we didn't accept them. And they accepted one of the patches, but because their patch that they tried to write was buggy, was actually correct. <laughs> so um, they really didn't do a good job about that. Um, the ethics people ripped them, really, really got mad about that because they lied in their paper what they had done. Um, they lied to us. They, when they were caught, it was a whole big nightmare. And the big thing that I, we take can take from that is open source software is more trustworthy, not necessarily because it's written better, but because you can go back in time and audit it. So what we did is we looked at all the contributions that that university had ever contributed to the kernel 
for forever. We audited everything. I had a whole bunch of interns at the moment, so we just let them loose and we audited everything we had. And it turns out they didn't really, they weren't that good of developers at the time. So we ripped all their old stuff out, fixed up the bugs and pushed out new updates. So you can't really do that with closed source stuff because you can't go back in time and see who contributed what, where it came from and change it and see how that works. Um, so since then we've worked with the university and they're, they have a, a very core kernel developer working with them to try and fix their procedures and how they work together and how they work in the community and teach them how to do things. But another thing that came out of that was everybody was like, oh no, you need to have verification of who's contributing to the kernel. Who's all the, who's doing all this work? Who's, who's doing all this crazy stuff? And the question is why? Why do we need that? Because your name's on there. We're not, we don't take anonymous things, known anonymous things. Um, and they're like, oh, well, we can't have people sneaking things in, sneaking bugs in. It's like, well, you do realize who writes the most bugs. Like, I don't know, who writes the most bugs? I'm like, your core developers write the most bugs. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, literally, it's a, just a matter of the odds. I mean, X, you say you write one, <laughs> one out of 10 changes is bad, right? So we're all human. So if I write a thousand changes, I wrote more bugs than somebody who just contributed two changes, right? Um, so the people you need to worry about the most are your core developers. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to put processes in place to catch everybody, all the bugs. So I want my, I want our testing tools and processes and infrastructure to catch all the bugs that I write. Because infamously, I have written some pretty bad security bugs over the years um, <laughs> and fixed them later. Yeah, but it's, it's just the way it goes. We're all human. Um, so I want you to catch my bugs. I want our tools to catch our bugs. And if they're going to catch the bugs of the core developers, they'll catch the bugs that are submitted from any developer. And that's the key. You need to have the tooling and the infrastructure in place in order to catch the problems that anybody can create because we're all human. So and we're all going to make mistakes. So just do that and then you're okay. And a lot of, a lot of open source projects have that, which is key. And that's all you really need to know. You don't need to know, verify who is doing what because your core people are the ones doing the most problems. 